So it is 7.35 p.m. It is Tuesday, October 18th, 2022. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein, and I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order, and I ask all attendees who are not recognized to speak to please mute their connection until such time as they're recognized by the chair. I would like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, so members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, unfortunately, Mr. DuPont is unable to join us this evening as he is under the weather. Uh, but Patrick Hanlon? Patrick is here. Uh, Daniel Riccadelli? Here. See you. Uh, Venkat Holly? Hi. Here. Good to see you. And Elaine Hoffman? Here. Good to see you as well. On behalf of the town, uh, Rick Dallarelli, our board administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Uh, assisting him, Vincent Lee. Here. Okay, good to have you. Uh, we're also joined this evening by town council, Doug Heim. Here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. And also uh, Kelly Linema, who's the assistant director of planning and community development. Here and also here is uh, Marisa Lau, senior planner from Permanent planning and oh, wonderful. Good to have you both. Um, <clears throat> and then appearing on behalf of the applicant, uh, we have uh, Paul Feldman from Davis Mall and Diagostine. Yeah, I'm here. See him here. And then uh, from the Majuri companies, uh, we have uh, Matthew Majuri, uh, Jacqueline Majuri, and Paul Majuri. Here. Good evening. Here. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, Good evening. evening. So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2023 of the remote meeting provision of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. <clears throat> As the board will be taking up new business at this, <clears throat> excuse me, as the board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. To start the meeting, um, the board would like to acknowledge the resignation of one of its members. Uh, Kevin Mills served this board for very many years with uh, integrity, with humility, and with humor. He has served us through the previous two 40B hearings and his presence and experience will be missed. He has uh, retired and has moved out of town. We thank him for his service to the town and to this board. So thank you, Kevin. We will, we will miss having you with us uh, on this journey here. Thank you, Kevin, for sure. Absolutely. 
Uh, the administrative items on tonight's agenda will be addressed after uh, the discussion of the comprehensive permit application, um, because I'm certain that every single person on this call is here for that instead. With that, um, going back to the agenda, I will move forward to item number four, which is docket number 3719, uh, 1025 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, we are now turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Mill Brook to be located at 1021 through 1025 Massachusetts Avenue. This evening, the board is opening a new comprehensive permit hearing. The proposed project, the residences at Mill Brook, is a redevelopment of an existing site in the neighborhood office, that's the B1 zoning district. The submitted documents are available from the board's website or as an attachment to the posted agenda. We open this evening with an introduction to the comprehensive permit procedure. The applicants will then be invited to introduce themselves and their team, and there will be a brief presentation of the proposed project made by the applicant. The board will then present questions to the applicant before we open the hearing to public comment and questions. Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yes, please. Hi, Paul Feldman for the applicant. With Mr. Mills' recognition and Mr. DuPont's um, inability to be here tonight, yep. there are currently five members of the board that are mm -hmm. sitting. That is correct. Um, I am not sure if, I don't know if Arlington um, has the rule where if you miss a meeting, you could watch the meeting or uh, watch the tape and then be eligible to vote. We uh, have adopted the, the Mullen rule, yes. Okay, so you have the Mullen rule. Yes. But at the end, there's going to be five members voting. Correct. Um, theoretically, right now, as of tonight, the five members that are sitting will be those members unless Mr. DuPont is, uh, mm -hmm. makes himself eligible. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. You're very welcome. <clears throat> so, the, so just uh, to give an introduction to the comprehensive permit law, because this is um, a little bit different than the normal business that the Zoning Board of Appeals mm -hmm. deals with. Uh, so the comprehensive permit law, also known as 40B, was established by the state in 1969 to allow developers devoting a certain percentage of the units in a development to being affordable, the developer could receive an expedited review whereby the Zoning Board of Appeals would hear the application and be authorized to grant waivers from any local statute, which it finds can be granted without negatively impacting the health, safety, and welfare of the local residents. The applicant cannot request waivers from state laws and regulations, which remain in full effect. Those include the Wetlands Act, Title V, the State Building Code, and similar state regulations. Uh, once a comprehensive permit is filed, the board has 30 days to open a public hearing. The town has seven days to notify departments, boards, and commissions of the receipt of the application and request comment. Once the hearing begins, the board has 180 days to hear the case and close the public hearing unless the parties mutually agree to extend. Once the hearing begins, the board has 15 days to notify the applicant if it will be declaring safe harbor under any of the provisions of the state law. Should the board make such a declaration, the applicant has 15 days to file an appeal. After the public hearing is closed, the board has 40 days to render a decision, unless the parties again mutually agree to extend. When a board is preparing a decision, it has three options. It may approve the project as submitted, it may approve the project with conditions, or it may deny the project. Any decision by the board may be appealed within 20 days of the issuance of the decision. Unless the town can demonstrate it's meeting its obligations in providing affordable housing, an appeal by the applicant is filed with the Housing Appeals Committee by design a developer friendly platform. So if the town does not meet any of the safe harbor provisions, if the decision of the board is appealed by the applicant, it goes to the Housing Appeals Committee. A butter appeals are heard at either Superior Court or Land Court. A town demonstrates it's meeting its affordable housing obligations by demonstrating compliance with one of the safe harbor provisions under the enabling state regulations. If the town cannot substantiate compliance using current figures, asserting it does so only leads to increased legal costs by the town. And so of the different options, one is the housing unit minimum, which would be whether the town has greater than 10% of the housing units list on the listed, excuse me, that the town has greater than 10% of its housing units listed on the subsidized housing index maintained by the state. The second would be the general land area minimum, 
where it's having greater than one and a half percent of the available land area dedicated to units on the subsidized housing index maintained by the state. And I would note that the formula for calculating the general land area minimum has been revised by the state within the past couple of years. Uh, there's also a total land area. So if the town has more than 0.3% of all land area in residential, commercial, and industrial areas dedicated to units on the subsidized housing index maintained by the state. Uh, the, for the housing production plan, if, it, if the town has met or exceeded 0.5% of the town's affordable housing production goal for that calendar year as established by the town. Whether there is recent progress towards a housing unit minimum, having created subsidized housing units equal to at least 2% of the municipality's total number of housing units within the past year. Uh, review of large projects. The number of units in the proposed project exceeds 2% of all the housing units in the municipality or related applications that prior applications for construction on the same land were received within the previous 12 months. The applicant needs to demonstrate that it meets the statutory requirements for its submittal to be considered for a comprehensive permit. Uh, the applicant must be a government agency, a nonprofit entity, or a limited dividend organization. They must demonstrate that they have site control they must have a project eligibility letter from a subsidizing agency like Max Housing. They must submit preliminary plans for review by the board. Final plans are not required until after the issuance of a comprehensive permit. Final plans are submitted are subject to review by the town for compliance with the decision and by inspectional services for compliance with the state building code. The applicant must submit existing condition plans and maps. They must submit a tabulation of proposed buildings on the site, and they must submit a list of requested waivers. The board cannot consider any impacts of a 40B project, that, excuse me, the board cannot consider any impacts a 40B project would have on the schools as families are a protected class under the Fair Housing Act. Um, the board is able to request funds from the applicant to allow the board to properly and thoroughly review the application and to supporting materials by hiring consulting engineers with expertise in areas like traffic, stormwater, utilities, urban design, architecture, and other similar disciplines. The board can engage a transcription service to create a written record of the hearings. Under certain circumstances, the board can retain a financial consultant to review the project's pro forma. Negotiations and work sessions may occur between the applicant and their consultants and the town and its consultants. However, no decisions can be made at any of those sessions. The board is limited to conditions which would be applied to similar proposed developments pursued through regular zoning. The board cannot consider, uh, the board cannot reduce the number of overall units unless it can demonstrate that the necessity to protect health, safety, and welfare of the residents. And the board cannot increase the percentage of affordable units or the affordabil affordability of the units. Only the subsidizing agency has the power to do so. Um, I would ask uh, our town councils at Heim if there's any other aspects of uh, the comprehensive permit law or local concerns you would like to mention at this time. No, Mr. Chairman, that was very uh, thorough and well stated. I suppose um, the uh, only other thing that I would uh, maybe add is that the 40B process is by its nature somewhat iterative. It's not abnormal for an applicant to submit an initial proposal for there to be uh, feedback and information that's received from town uh, officials, the Zoning Board of Appeals itself, from the public, and there to be modifications to that. Um, a dialogue or conversation is uh, normal. And I also would just want to emphasize that uh, something that you said, which is uh, very important in many of these contexts, which is that this comprehensive permit does address all town uh, bylaws and zoning bylaws, but it does not address um, permitting under the Wetlands Protection Act, which is um, remains governed by the Towns Conservation Commission. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Um, at this point, I would like to introduce uh, Attorney Paul Feldman from Davis Mom de Augustine to introduce the project team and to make a presentation to the board and to the town explaining the proposed project. Um, Mr. Feldman. Uh, good evening, Paul Feldman with Davis Mom and D'Augustine. Uh, I represent the applicant. 
Um, the presentation is going to be uh, presented by Matthew Maggiore, um, um, who is um, a manager of the applicant and a uh, <coughs> uh, president of Maggiore uh, Construction Corporation. And I'm going to turn it over to him right away so that we don't waste any time. Thank you. Uh, Chairperson Klein, uh, is there an ability to share screen? Mr. Valerelli, can you assist with that? You're good to go, Mr. Maggiore. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just as, excuse me. Um, as it has often happened when we have these hearings that, that that in order to understand them, you have to understand the presentation. And I just like to request that uh, after the hearing today that uh, Mr. Majuri uh, submits the slides that he's probably about to show us uh, so that we have them in the record uh, and a permanent record of them other than by watching the hearing on ACMI. Thank you, Ms. Anna. Is that okay with you, Mr. Majuri? Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Jackie, could you, um, I'm having trouble doing a, sh a screen share for some reason. Um, I tested this earlier. Do you mind um, pulling up the PowerPoint? Sure. Um, can I just get the ability to share the screen as well? I apologize. Oh. Uh, Jackie, just give me a second. Sure. Sorry for the delay. No, no. Okay, Jackie, good to go. Okay. Let me just get to where. Okay, Matt, you can just let me know. Sure. Okay, go ahead. So uh, good evening, folks. Again, for the record, my name is Matthew Maggiore, 13 Wheeling Avenue, Woburn, Massachusetts. Uh, here with me this evening is uh, the, uh, my father and founder and CEO of uh, our company, uh, Paul Maggiore, um, Jacqueline Maggiore, who is our director of marketing and real estate. And again, um, Paul Feldman, um, who's suffering from a bit of, of an illness this evening. And we're going to save Paul's voice and I'll be the voice this evening and Paul can chime in um, to answer any uh, pertinent questions that may come up. Mm -hmm. Um, we want to thank the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals in the town of Arlington for affording us the opportunity for a, a meeting dedicated to uh, the permitting of this project. We're excited to be here this evening and thank you for getting this first one scheduled for us and we look forward to future meetings. Um, the applicant for this project is 1025 Mass Ave LLC. It's a limited dividend company. Um, the members of uh, the LLC are affiliated with our parent company, the Maggiore Companies which is a 45 year old company founded by Paul. Uh, we are in the real estate development and construction and property management business. We've been in the same location in Woburn, Massachusetts for the last 45 years, the same address. And uh, we enjoy a great relationship uh, in the uh, real estate community, the uh, real estate brokerage community, um, architects, engineers, uh, everyone who knows the Maggiores uh, knows that we, we built a uh, we build quality projects and we are uh, uh, people of, uh, of, of uh, character. Um, we can go to the next slide. We've assembled, assembled a phenomenal team uh, from the permitting of this project and ultimately the design and construction and delivery of first class project. Um, the architect for this project is, is going to be Harrison Mulhern Architects. The, uh, the uh, Owner of that company is Chris Mulhern. You'll get to know him, get to know him uh, later on in our presentation in future meetings. Uh, again, uh, Attorney Paul Feldman of Davis Mom D Augustine. Uh, Paul has been working with the Majoris for over 25 years. Paul's uh, an expert in real estate um, law and has permitted several several successful 40B and affordable apartment and condo projects uh, throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, we have a relationship with Dave Alt, uh, who's the uh, uh, senior Vice President of Cambridge Savings Bank, who's uh, provided a letter for us um, as a member of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston. 
and we intend to engage Cambridge Savings Bank for the construction financing for this project. Uh, Patriot Engineering uh, is owned by Mike Novak. Uh, Mike's our civil engineer. He's been helping us with, uh, with everything on the civil end of the project. Um, Rich Kirby uh, from LEC is our environmental and wetlands consultant. Uh, Rich enjoys a, a very fine relationship with the Arlington Conservation Commission, and he's a welcome member of our team. Uh, Sean Kelly of Vanassen Associates um, prepared our uh, traffic impact statement, and uh, I'm sure you'll be meeting him later on in the, in the process. Uh, Kyle Zick of KZLA Landscape Architecture. Uh, Kyle's been instrumental in helping us design um, the mitigation that we're proposing in the riverfront area of our property. Um, and finally, uh, Compass Real Estate, Albert Lynch, who introduced us to the sellers of the properties at 1021 and 1025 Mass Ave, and we intend to engage for the marketing of the project once it, hope, once it hopefully comes to fruition. Next slide. But, um, we've attached or we enclosed a uh, copy of the project eligibility letter that we received from Mass Housing on August 19th. They should be online and in our submission that we provided to, to the town. Um, if further copies of this are necessary, we'll obviously include that in, in the slides that we that we turn in um, after this meeting. Yeah, they push it in the April one. Oh. What's that? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I thought someone had a question. Uh, just to give you a little uh, flavor of some of our signature projects. Next slide. This is a project in Wakefield called Wakefield Station. It's a 60 unit condominium project and 10,000 feet of retail space on the first floor. And we're gonna be using a lot of design cues uh, from this project to apply to Arling the Arlington project, um, trying to basically, um, we have a five story building that we're trying to make look like a four story building for massing purposes. As you can see in this picture, the fifth floor is set back from the plane of the fourth floor to give it the look and feel and massing of a smaller building. Next slide. This is a project we recently completed in Reading. It was, this was a 40R project um, permitted with the town of Reading. It's a 31 unit apartment building with 3,000 feet of retail. This was a project that was eight years in the permit process in the city of Somerville. It's a combination of a new VFW post and a 29 unit condominium facility with underground parking right in Davis Square. Uh, this is a recently completed condominium facility that we constructed for uh, an outside client. This is also a 32 unit condominium project in Watertown on North Beacon Street. You might, you folks might know this project because it's kind of on the outskirts of Arlington, right, 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 in, basically in Woburn, Woburn Arlington line. Uh, this is a project at uh, Shannon Farm, the old Shannon Farm. It's a 112 unit townhouse condominium project with Clubhouse. Jumping in quickly uh, to the description of the project, um, we have the properties at 1021 and 1025-27 Massachusetts Avenue um, under contract to purchase and in the approval of our, of our proposal to the ZBA and highlight in yellow are the two parcels. Next slide. Uh, here's a couple of uh, views from uh, Google Earth of the property looking east from Mass down Mass Ave and um, looking west. This is the existing conditions plan that shows the uh, two existing structures and the existing, to, uh, existing topography and, um, and um, wooded area behind the property. Um, we are, there's approximately 0.43 acres of this project in the, the riverfront area. And we'll be getting to discussions on our proposal to, uh, to um, mitigate and um, implement a, 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 a new planting program and a private garden slash park space for the residents of this proposed development. Next slide. Yeah, Matt, be before you jump off that slide, um, I think we should create some uh, a little better orientation for the board. 
Mass Avenue is running along the bottom of this particular existing conditions plan, you'll notice a dashed line, which is set back 200 feet from uh, the brook. That is the boundary of the riverfront between 100 feet from the riverfront and 200 feet from the riverfront. We talk about that as the outer riverfront boundary. So you'll see that the property that's going to be disturbed is within the 100 to 200 foot setback. Uh, the, the, other th the other thing you should note is that the riverfront area is the only wetland resource that impacts this property. There are no other wetland resources that are implicated on this property or by this development. Uh, finally, um, if you have familiarity with reading topo lines, um, topographic lines, you'll notice how in the back of the property, the topo, the topographic lines are rather close to one another. Um, that indicates um, a steep change in topography. And this site does dip down considerably from Mass Avenue, relatively flat as you go by the existing buildings and the existing disturbed area. And then as you get to the back of the lot, it does drop down. Uh, the last thing to just note is that separating the brook from the property is a parking lot that is um, unrelated to the property. It is owned by an adjacent condominium and used by that condominium. Um, just wanted to point out some of those existing features um, before before we got off the slide. Thank you, Paul. Next slide. So uh, this is the pro proposed site plan. And again, similar to the last slide, Massachusetts Avenue is along the bottom of this plan. Uh, highlighted in yellow is the proposed structure that will house the 50 units and into a parking area. And at the rear, uh, at the rear in blue is our proposed uh, roof water infiltration system. And you can see uh, the pathways and the planting um, around that area that would become the park, private park slash garden space for the residents of the project. And that it would be within the area that we're intending to improve and mitigate in the riverfront. So, so one thing to highlight before we get off of this plan, Matt, um, the building is going to be located almost entirely on area that's already been disturbed either by the existing structures or by driveways or by parking. There is a couple of thousand square feet of um, area that's previously not been disturbed that will be within the footprint of the building. So you see the dashed line uh, on the back corner of the building um, where we again point out the 200 foot riverfront area. Um, within that area already, a good portion of that area has already been disturbed with asphalt pavement and the like. You can see it outlined with the squiggly lines, but there is some new disturbance there. The other thing that is hard to appreciate from this particular depiction is that the blue uh, subsurface um, drainage system from when the project is developed will be part of um, the um, um, redesigned urban um, uh, garden that has been planned for the entire back portion of the property. That structure is subsurface. You're not going to see that, and it's going to be uh, developed above um, with, um, as Matt will get to, an appropriate uh, program. Thank Thanks for that. So tying in, um, th this would be a little more uh, developed, uh, detailed landscaping plan. Um, as Paul mentioned, the area over the infiltration system would be a, a grassed meadow type of area. Um, as you can see, there's walking paths. There's, there'll be seating back there. Um, there'll be um, naturally uh, occurring um, things like logs that were left left for uh, for uh, establishment of or maintenance of um, of that area, as well as uh, 
a robust planting plan with native trees, shrubs, um, bushes, and you know, very, very robust and, and beautiful area that we intend to also irrigate uh, to be able to maintain uh, for the association. And we can, we'll be getting into obviously those details more thoroughly in future meetings when uh, Kyle is um, here with us to present. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, basically cut and paste from our uh, application to mass housing just gives you some some of the data or some of the pertinent information on the project. Uh, the project is a total of, of 50 condominium units, 37 market rate units, and 13 affordable units at 80% area median income. The uh, gross floor area is 97,110 square feet. We have a height of 60 feet in five stories. One of those stories is set back from the plane of uh, the first through the fourth floor, um, again, to um, create the, the feel and the massing of a four-story building um, for the purposes of um, the trying to try to be in keeping with, uh, with the area and other buildings on Mass Ave. We have 53, uh, 50 indoor parking spaces proposed. So it was a one-to-one -one ratio on parking. And uh, next slide, Jeff. Next slide. Um, of the 50 units, we have five three bedroom units, 35 two bedroom units, and 10 one bedroom units. And I did misspeak, it's actually 53 indoor parking spaces. We did some reconfiguration and we were able to get 53 parking spaces indoors. In the basement of, of this project, uh, we have 49 bicycle storage units. Um, and within the uh, first floor garage, 26 hanging bicycle racks and an exterior bicycle rack. The basement also will have 53 storage units. So there'll be a storage unit for each unit owner, as well as common area storage. We're proposing a 1700 foot retail space, uh, the right front corner of um, the property with a beautiful plaza area. Hopefully we'll be able to get some sort of use that will complement the area and complement the building, be it a coffee shop or a, uh, perhaps a bike shop or you know, something that would be uh, appropriate for for this use could be potentially a restaurant might be a little small for that but um, we're, we're not ruling that out um, amenities within the project will include the uh, fitness center management office we would intend to have a uh, person on site doing maintenance and cleaning um, not all the time but probably three to four days per week um, two elevators accessing all floors including the basement and the second floor common area courtyard uh, green space which will have some private decks as well as some um, common gathering space with the grills and seating for the residents of the project. And again, the mitigation in the rear would uh, would create a private resident garden, garden amenity space uh, for the residents. <clears throat> Next slide. Paul, shall we review each of these waivers um, individually? Uh, no, I, I don't think we have to, but let me just generally uh, describe them because there looks to be a lot more here than there really is. Um, there are uh, the first group of waivers are requested from the zoning bylaw, the most important of which is in this particular zoning district, multifamily use is not an allowed use or especially permitted use. We're in the B1 zone. Um, so we need a waiver from the use limitations to allow for multifamily use. That's the most important waiver request. Um, some of the other waiver requests um, from zoning that I want to draw your attention to in particular is the um, height limitation. It's three stories or 35 feet under zoning, and the request is five stories or 61 feet and eight inches. Um, Correspondingly, the floor area ratio uh, in this district is 0.75. We're looking for 2.0. You know, some of these parameters all work together because multifamily is not an allowed use. You have these other dimensional limitations, which are more in line with the types of uses that are typically allowed under zoning. So when you move to a multifamily project, you're moving to dimensional requirements that are more typical of a multifamily project than 
that's so the, those are those waiver requests. Um, and then finally, uh, the parking um, uh, is proposed to be one parking space per unit. There's a tiered uh, ratio in multifamily developments um, that would have resulted in a slightly uh, greater ratio than one per unit. That's in general the zoning. Uh, the town has uh, bicycle parking design guidelines and um, typically um, uh, hanging bicycle racks would not be counted. Um, we're looking for a waiver from that limitation. We have the correct amount of bicycle storage in combination between actual, you know, accessible bike storage, the way the guidelines want us to have, but to get the numbers up so that they comply with the total number of available bike uh, racks. Uh, we have 26 hanging racks that are designed into the project. Um, the uh, reference to the tree protection and preservation bylaw, you'll see the applicant is seeking a waiver uh, or uh, payment to a tree fund uh, as we get into it at later meetings. Uh, what this project proposes is to um, uh, take an area of um, trees that are, are invasive Norway maples um, and actually start from the beginning and rebuild a native um, uh, design, uh, urban design that uh, can actually um, serve as a model for how to rehabilitate um, uh, areas uh, in, an, in an urban setting so that they're providing the right habitat and the right type of vegetation uh, for years to come. Um, the wetlands protection request is simply uh, that um, under the local wetlands bylaw, we're seeking our permit through this comprehensive permit. As town council mentioned, we are going to need a order of conditions under the state wetlands protection act. We will independently go to the conservation commission for the state wetlands protection act order of conditions, but the local bylaw wetlands protection order of conditions we're requesting from the ZBA. Same thing with the uh, stormwater management permit that we need locally. Uh, it should be issued through this process. One of the buildings, 1021 Mass 270, was listed on the historic structures inventory. Um, we're simply, it's not an historic district or anything like that. It's a building identified on the, on the uh, um, inventory and uh, we're looking for either a waiver of the uh, demolition delay or a finding uh, through this process that the particular building's demolition will not be uh, detrimental to historical or ar architectural heritage of the town, which is what would be the finding usually made by the historical commission, but we take care of it here in this process. Um, there's a minor waiver request with outdoor lighting. Um, later on uh, in, in this process, you'll see we have some exterior up lighting that's designed, you know, in the in the roof and some of the um, uh, second floor um, a courtyard area that uh, uh, is is we think of appropriate uh, for this particular project. But there's an up lighting prohibition in the outdoor lighting uh, regulations that we're requesting a waiver of. I think that basically highlights on that. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this is a rendering of the front of the building along Mass Ave. Uh, we'll be getting into the architecture, architectural aspects of this project in more detail in future meetings, but we're proposing, a, again, a five-story building with a setback fifth floor. Um, the towers on either end of the building are and down the sides and, and on the first floor are intended to be a, a gray brick. Uh, we have a combination of um, cementious and aluminum composite metal panels um, uh, on the on the front uh, projections of the building. We would be proposing a black painted vinyl casement window for the project and we're uh, we're all about higher you know higher end finishes that 
um, give uh, the richness that this you know project and this location deserve. And we're excited about um, explaining this further in the process. Next slide. Now this is a view uh, of the interior courtyard. So the building is uh, somewhat of a U shape and this interior courtyard again would, would service uh, some private deck space for some of the residents on that uh, first floor of living as well as common outdoor space uh, for grilling and gathering and entertaining. Uh, these are the front and rear elevations of the project. There's a bit of a detail here that's probably difficult to see, but again, um, available online and um, in the package that we'll provide to the town after this meeting. Next slide. Uh, this would be the right and left elevation, same, uh, same thing, difficult to see, uh, but we can, uh, that'll be available online and in, in the package. <clears throat> Here's the basement in the ground floor plan. Um, again, the basement depicts the um, utility areas, electric room, um, uh, excuse me, um, elevated machine room, uh, water service room, bike storage, and general storage units for the residents and for common area. The ground floor plan shows the 53 parking spaces, a retail space at the front right corner, a tenant gym behind it, um, the office, the package storage, stairwell, elevators, and trash room. And this is a this is a garage at grade, so you're coming in off of Mass Ave at grade and entering this facility um, at grade. Next slide. And uh, this is the second and third floor plan. On uh, the second plan, so second floor depicts uh, an overhead view of the a common garden space as well as a common corridors uh, to access that space. Third floor. And here's the fourth and fifth floor plan. And you can see the fifth, fifth floor set back significantly from the fourth floor. Again, going back to my com uh, comment about massing and trying to um, give the look and feel of a four-story building while still be able to get the density that we need um, to be able to make this project possible. And that's the end of the, uh, of the, the slideshow. Um, we can open it up to questions. We can turn it back to um, mm -hmm. Christian. And uh, again, we thank everybody for taking the time to uh, be with us this evening and for giving us the opportunity to be here uh, to present. So thank you. Well, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, <clears throat> are there questions from the board in regards to the presentation? Um, as we proceed through the hearings, the board will have uh, more information from the consultants and the applicants, and there'll be ample opportunity for more detailed discussion. At this time, I'm asking questions to be limited to the information presented this evening. So are there specific questions from the board? Mr. Hanlon. Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, I guess this question is for Mr. Feldman. Um, Ravers have been requested for the stormwater management bylaw and from the uh, local uh, wetlands protection bylaw in favor of the uh, state uh, permits that deal with both of those things. And I, my question is whether in either of those cases, there are specific provisions of the local bylaws that are problematic to you uh, that we would we could if we wanted to be follow the minimum waiver possible focus on just that or whether this is really a matter of trying to just get the local bylaw out of the picture so that you deal only with the state. Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Hanlon, and it's an important one to clar clarify. With regard to the stormwater, the stormwater system has been designed in compliance with the local requirements of your stormwater management plan. What we are asking a waiver for, and it's not really a waiver, I didn't exactly know where to put it, but I wanted to be more inclusive and at the risk of being over-inclusive, I put it on the waiver list. The waiver request is that we need not obtain the stormwater management permit that either has to be issued by the engineering department or the engineering department's designee. The permit should 
be issued through this comprehensive permit process. But our design, um, as I understand it from our civil engineer, conforms to the requirements of the stormwater management design guidelines in Arlington. So we're not looking for a waiver, a design waiver. With regard to the Wetlands Protection Act, it's a very similar situation. We believe that we have uh, designed a um, project that would entitle us to meet the performance standards under your local bylaw for work within the outer 100 foot riverfront area. Um, there is some new disturbance that, as I said, um, is being presented. It's not substantial, um, uh, but there is a, a, um, an excessive, um, I'm not gonna say excessive, a, a, a very large mitigation program that is being proposed to address that. Um, the board should know that the applicant um, did appear before the Arlington Conservation Commission um, several times in a pre-filing working session. They were public meetings of the Arlington Conservation Commission to, you know, present uh, this project in a in a in a um, uh, a less detailed way, but focusing on the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission to get some feedback. Um, the Conservation Commission wasn't in a position to make any decisions. We didn't have a particular application in front of the Conservation Commission, but it is the process and habit of the Conservation Commission to engage in working sessions with applicants if they're willing to um, uh, do so if the applicants were going to do so, and we very much were. So we got a lot of feedback from those working sessions. The feedback we took from those working sessions is in the proposed design that you're looking at. But this proposed design has not been reviewed by the Conservation Commission. Um, I'm sure as part of this process, you'll get input and feedback from the Conservation Commission, but it's for this board to determine whether we meet the local wetland performance standards for an order of conditions. We believe we meet the local performance standards. And we know you'll, you'll collaborate with your colleagues at the Conservation Commission. Uh, we're hoping that we heard the Conservation Commission's feedback correctly, but we're not prejudging and we didn't ask the Conservation Commission to, to prejudge our proposal because they didn't see they haven't seen the details of it. And this is the first presentation of it. So again, we're not looking for a particular waiver of a particular performance standard um, um, as because we think we meet the performance standards to be entitled to an order of conditions. We are looking for the um, issuance of that order of conditions from the Zoning Board of Appeals through the comprehensive permit as the law provides. Um, I will just reserve for one thing, and I, I, I got to confirm this with Rich Kirby. Um, it's not on our waiver list now, but I will for the next meeting that um, we had some discussion, and I want to make sure that, you know, the what, I, what we call the newly disturbed area, there is no limitation on the newly disturbed area uh, under the performance standards, but perhaps there's a waiver to be articulated on that. Um, it, it hasn't been yet, but because I don't think we technically need it, but I'll take another look at that. Thank you, Mr. Hamm. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. I guess this question may be for Mr. Majority. Um, um, you've got approximately, what, 97,000 gross, uh, gross floor area. Uh, and I wonder if you have any estimate for if you were just looking at the conditions floor area as you would have to for the uh, state building permit for the energy part of it. Um, it would presumably be less than that. And do you have any idea what the uh, uh, what the condition uh, floor area would be? The footage, the square footage of the condition floor area. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, this is a long term process, and so I don't want to really put you in a position of calculating on the spot. But if you could provide that information, that would be great. Sure. Um, I will 
Oh, just give me a, a minute to to get to that, and I will uh, I'll chime back in a moment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Are there other members of the board with questions? Sure. Yeah, I, I just had um, a couple of questions. Um, for the, uh, I know uh, we'll have a chance to ask more questions and get an intro from the design team uh, later in this process, but for the ground level parking that uh, you mentioned, uh, is the intent for that to be enclosed or uh, have open, open sides? It's a fully enclosed uh, garage space that would be climate controlled. So no, no open louvers on the side. Um, there will be louvers for carbon monoxide exhaust uh, evacuation, um, but it's a fully climate controlled uh, garage. And um, to go back to the previous question, the, the gross floor area conditioned of the first floor is 25,020 square feet. Great. I just had uh, one more question. Um, so the um, the rear yard, uh, which you, you guys showed a landscape plan for um, up against Mill Brook, is that um, just accessed by building residents, or is that publicly accessed area? Uh, that would be a, a private space only, because of the liability that the condo association would be faced with. Um, we were designated as as private uh, resident only access. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else from the board? None. Um, I would just say for, for members of the board and for members of the public as well, um, the drawings that you saw as a part of the application, uh, there is a full size drawing set available for public review. Uh, there is one set at the planning department and there's one set at inspectional services. Uh, so if um, if looking at it on your screen or you know printing it out yourself is not uh, is not working for you, um, inspectional services and the planning department can help you view a larger size set of drawings for those documents. <clears throat> okay. So tonight's hearing will shortly be open for public comment. But before we do, I want to review some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. So public questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Due to previously demonstrated interest in this project and to provide for an orderly flow to the meeting, the chair strongly encourages individual public speakers to limit their comments and to use their time to provide comment related solely to the topics discussed at this hearing. It would be particularly helpful to hear what aspects to the project should be the focus of specific review and discussion at later hearings. Please note there will be multiple hearings scheduled for this project and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. The chair also encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board and included in the record and those that have been received um, up to this point were available on the uh, agenda for tonight's meeting. The chair asks, <clears throat> the chair will first ask members of the uh, public who have previously identified themselves by logging in through Zoom who wish to speak to digitally raise their hand using the raise hand button on the participants tab in the Zoom application. You'll be called upon by the chair. Uh, you may unmute yourself and you'll be asked to give your name and address for the record and you'll be given up to five minutes for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly, concisely and in a way that helps generate an accurate record of the meeting. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, you may unmute your line. Please identify yourself by name and address for the record. You will be given up to five minutes for your questions and comments. All questions, again, are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly, concisely, and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. Once all public questions and comments have been addressed, or we have, it is now 8.30, so we have reached the hour of 9.30. Uh, the public comment period for this evening's hearing will be closed. As noted previously, there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project, and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. 
the board, the applicant and staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. If you'd like a specific document to be displayed during your comments, please ask us to do so. And we will do our best to accommodate your request. Uh, so with that, I will formally open uh, tonight's meeting for public comment. And I'm just gonna quickly put down the name in the order I have them. Okay, uh, the first name I see uh, is Barbara Thornton. Ms. Thornton, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, yeah. name and address. And Barbara Thornton, 223 Park Ave, Arlington. Uh, first of all, uh, I understand I'm addressing uh, Mr. Klein. Mr. That Klein, please convey, please convey uh, my absolute delight that, that this team of uh, uh, developers has decided to bring this project to Arlington. Uh, speaking as somebody who is at some point in my life going to be in the market for, for downsizing and wanting to stay in Arlington, I'm looking at this hard. I'm, I'm ready to pick my corner but uh, or, or space. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, suggest a couple of things that I think would make it, and I don't want to be too much the future owner, but I am, I, I, that is how I'm looking at it. I am delighted that you are having a permanently affordable uh, home ownership opportunities for people in Arlington that are, that are more affordable than are in now. When I moved to Arlington, there was a, there was a real mix of, of incomes in town. And I really love to be in a project and in a town that reclaimed that opportunity. Uh, second, I, I want to um, encourage you to use all that open space that you have uh, to take a look at Doug Tallamy, if you haven't yet, and his idea of a homegrown national park. It would be nice to have a little uh, homegrown national park right there on, on Mass Ave. And it looks like you can make a contribution to that with, with the open space and the way you're thinking about using it. Uh, I am I am a little concerned about the uh, waiver on the uplighting. Um, if yeah, I would appreciate the board looking more at the uh, open space, but I would also appreciate the board looking more critically at why they need uplighting. I would like to maintain a dark skies policy in Arlington wherever possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Um, next on our list is uh, David Pritzer. Uh, hello, uh, I'm David Pretzer at 44 Grove Street in Arlington. Um, thank you, Mr. Klein and ZBA for having me. Uh, I just wanted to say that I think this is a very, a very strong proposal. I think this is the sort of location we want to encourage additional housing being built. It's right on Mass Ave with, with very good access to public transit in terms of the 77 bus. It also has easy access to the Minuteman bikeway. I think um, to address you know, the housing crisis in this region, we need to encourage additional housing and additional affordable housing to be built. Um, and in terms of climate change and our co contributions environmentally, uh, building this housing in areas that present you know, alternatives to, um, to private cars for the residents to get around is very valuable. And so I think um, I think this is very valuable. I mean, I, I, I personally, I live on Grove Street, which is basically the same uh, block um, as this proposal. And this is exactly the sort of thing I think should be going up in my neighborhood. I think it's a great spot for additional housing and we definitely need both, both market rate and affordable housing. Um, and in terms of what the board should be paying attention to, uh, I do want to point out that Millbrook, which runs very near this property, does flood um, when we have severe rain events. And so I think it's very important to um, ensure that this property is making all necessary, um, you know, uh, taking all necessary steps to address 
uh, stormwater runoff and flooding concerns and so on, um, because uh, I think it is in an area that, you know, that floods and obviously, um, you, know, maybe, you know, making sure that it's not gonna have any negative impact on neighbors in that respect is, is very important. Um, yeah, and I, I guess the other point I wanted to make is that one thing, you know, in addition to just needing more housing in general, one thing Arlington really lacks is housing that is accessible to people who use wheelchairs. Um, and as, you know, people age, the ability to get to their apartment without needing to navigate stairs is very valuable. So I think this could be also a strong addition to Arlington stock of accessible housing and housing that could um, be uh, used by people with mobility limitations. So I encourage the board to help work with the developer to make this development possible. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on our list is uh, Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, uh, Piedmont Street, and a member of the Arlington Tree Committee. Um, I, I do want to applaud the efforts of, of the developer here in, in providing a, a a thorough plan and, and the addition of affordability and affordable units in town is, is always a plus. Um, certainly this, this project would contribute to uh, dealing with that issue that we have in town, which is not enough housing referred to by the, the previous uh, two speakers. Um, and I also want to bring up the fact that uh, Arlington is facing a, a lot of significant issues of, of many different sorts that we're trying to handle. Uh, one of the ones that the tree committee has been working very hard on is a uh, uh, maintenance and uh, growth of the Arlington tree canopy, which is under right now severe strain and decline. We're trying to um, stabilize that and increase it. And at one point during the presentation, I heard something the effect of uh, the only, I may have misheard it. I'm not sure that I heard it right, but that um, the resource, the only resource effective in town uh, with this project would be the, the Millbrook area. And I do want to point out that there is a significant amount of trees on this property currently in the back section. It is a town resource. It's on private land, of course, but it is a town resource uh, within the, the town boundaries. The, the rather forested area in back, which is quite thick and, and hidden, serves as a significant water mitigation area uh, right now and probably helps during the Millbrook flooding uh, re referred to by the previous speaker. Um, and I understand that a lot of that area is going to be retained as forest or replanted as forest, but right now it's, it's quite thick natural grown forest that's serving the purpose. And there are some very significant trees that this project is going to take. Uh, four foot wide, what looks to be 70, 80 foot tall trees in some cases. And that will be a loss to the resources of the town. Um, and I, I'm not sure, the only reason I'm bringing this up now is because the waivers were mentioned. And one of the waivers is from the tree reservation bylaw, which I don't understand why this commercial project along with any other projects in town should get such a waiver. The reason the waiver's in place is to try and retain trees so they don't get taken for projects like this. So I don't, I don't really support a, a waiver of that particular provision in town and don't quite understand why it's requested. I know there'll be more opportunity to comment later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Next on our list um, is Mrs. Warden. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's uh, John Worden here. Uh, I, I, I uh, uh, Mrs. Worden and I uh, are doing this together. Unfortunately, we can't seem to make our pictures seen for some reason. Uh, can you hear me, by the way? We can. Yes, sir. Good. All right. Please proceed. And and I I uh, I, I want to say uh, I, I we're we're both we both have raised hands. Uh, I I. I I would like to speak first briefly, and then I, I and then uh, Mrs. Worden would like to speak, if that's permissible. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, I, uh, let me begin. Uh, uh, John Worden, uh, Jason Street Town Meeting Member, Precinct Eight. 
and a longtime resident of the town. Um, I was asked um, uh, by someone recently, what's a friendly 40B? And uh, uh, thought about that and well, friendly 40B is like a friendly mosquito bite or a friendly wasp sting or maybe a friendly snake bite. In other words, friendly like that who needs enemies. Uh, this project is outsized just from a number of waivers. It's a huge, looks like it takes up two thirds of the, of, of the lot area. Uh, it's totally uh, inappropriate for, for this site. Uh, it's totally, uh, I mean, just from a number of waivers, uh, this, the, the, uh, the town, the, the town's elected representatives of the people have decided what kind of zoning they want in this area. And the developer says, what do I care about what the people decide? I want to, I want to make my money here. I'm going to put this building where I want it. I'm, I'm going to ask for seven different waivers of your laws, uh, because I need to fill my pockets. And I, uh, I think that's a, a totally, uh, uh, totally in, inappropriate. All the, all the town gets out of it. We're already the, such a dense town. Uh, is a few uh, a few affordable apartments affordable for people who have six figure incomes. So uh, I would uh, um, like to. Uh, I, I, I really uh, want to uh, uh, say that uh, I, I I I looking at this project, the, the whole thing, the whole monstrous building. The cut down of the forest, uh, the 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 um, the, the in, in, uh, interruption of the natural flow of, of water and stuff, and and uh, the, the the just a huge bulk and ug ugliness of the building. Uh, this is a project to which you should just say no. And and I, I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, uh, Mrs. Warden. Oh, I did. Oh, I, Mr. I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, the, I hope the members of the commission, of the, of the board, will uh, read the the uh, long uh, and detailed document that Mrs. Warden has previously submitted, which was not attached to the agenda for some reason. But it, it's a thorough analysis of the whole pro of the whole project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. This is Patricia Warden. Um, it's important to know that Arlington would not have to face the danger of this 40B project if town officials had not chosen to approve it with all its dishonesty and secrecy. Did the select board really think that a historic house, many trees and sustainability efforts should be destroyed to be replaced by a huge and inefficient apartment building with 33 barely affordable units and zero, zero units which are affordable to very low income families, those most in danger of homelessness and for which Arlington has the greatest need. Our historic houses are now targets for developers since they are often on somewhat larger lots. Indeed, Arlington's first 40B project involved destruction of two Civil War era historic houses. Arlington should not support for the loss of its remaining historic homes. Arlington is already the 12th most dense municipalities in Massachusetts. Of Arlington's 20,461, housing units, 61% are already in multifamily or two-family buildings. We have for many decades um, ensured against homelessness and worked for it, against it. We are close to, or may even exceed, the 1.5% land area affordability safe harbor statutory requirement if Arlington officials choose to do the work to properly and accurately classify non-residential structures as being in conservancy institutional districts and not in residential districts. Um, 
Following with a list of infractions in this particular project protocol, um, first, egregious are violations of the Commonwealth smart growth principles. Secondly, confusing and uncorrected statements by Mass Housing early on that the size of the site is 22.98 acres, whereas in fact it is one acre. Denial, third, denial by the applicant that this site contains a house designed as a landmark building. Fourth, staff and secrecy, absence of transparency and public information about the project. Fifth, absence of solicitation of comments from the local community. Um, Six, lack of information provided to local boards other than the Conservation Commission and the Redevelopment Board. No acquaintances of mine serving on other town boards were even made aware of the project. Seven, disregard for Arlington's efforts for sustainable development. Eight, disregard for Arlington's bylaw to prevent fossil fuel accommodation in new construction. And ninth, possible conflicts of interest. Thank you very much, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mrs. Warden. Um, next on our list um, is uh, Don Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I just have a few questions for the applicant, and I assume they'll be answered at a future hearing, not tonight. Um, the height of this building is going to be a major point of concern in its impact on its neighbors. There are more than 50 families that live on the northwest side of this project who will be adversely affected. The applicant has provided an illustration showing the building in the context of other buildings along uh, Mass Ave. Could they provide a similar view uh, along Brattle Street, uh, taking into account the topography? And could they also provide a shadow study showing the impact on its abutters? Second, uh, I noticed that the applicants are not requesting a waiver for usable open space requirements. Could they provide some detail in what they are claiming for usable open space with the specific square footage? And third, uh, sort of following on from what Mr. Moore raised a little earlier, could they explain why paying into the tree fund is going to jeopardize the profitability of a $30 million project. Uh, I'd like to, you know, it, we see this a lot in 40Bs or other projects where the developer says, well, if we do this, it won't be affordable. Um, I think some financial um, data and justification for that should accompany this claim in it, um, for a waiver. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Next on our list is uh, Carl Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you hear me okay and see me? Absolutely, sir. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, 40B for anybody who is new to it, and I'm sort of new as we, a lot of us are, is a process where projects are basically thrust upon communities like Arlington. And a lot of our local rules, as you mentioned, sir, in your introduction, um, get passed over. We, we lose local, local control. The, the goal of a 40B is nominally to make some affordable housing. 25% uh, of the unit or thir 13 individual apartments are going to be, quotes, affordable. But in actual fact, in oftentimes, and perhaps in this project, the cost of living in those 13 units is very similar to the older apartments in town. Uh, it depends on the number of people in, and, in them, of course. The 75% of the other uh, units that will be built will be built at the highest rate possible. And in almost all instances, projects like this increase the average cost of living in our town. 
So they answer a supply question, but they don't answer our affordability housing crisis, which is the only one Arlington has. I'd like to say that there is a future perhaps where Arlington uh, town authorities could look at properly classifying how our residential spaces are, 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 um, are existing and that we could meet the 1.5% uh, safe harbor. As you, Mr. Chairman, noted earlier, uh, that safe harbor exists. So 40B projects uh, are a problem that we lose control and we might not have to have this one and others if we properly look at the safe harbor. This, the second thing I wanted to say is that since we have to take a 40B project currently, I don't think waivers, uh, unless they are very small waivers, should be on the books really for, for this board to be giving, particularly waivers that uh, make it unfair for other developers or other people in the community, such as saying that you wouldn't have to go to the board that properly looks at historical things or environmental concerns, or you wouldn't have to go through the normal process, seems particularly unfair when a project is being thrust on our shoulders like this. And, and of course, Arlington is facing, as we all should be aware, a large deficit, structural deficit of up to $5 million, I believe, very soon after the ARPA funds uh, expire. And Arlington should not be letting this developer in a 40 b project or any developer get waivers to not pay us for the loss uh, or the fees that would normally be incurred. And finally, uh, specifically in the area of trees, there are dozens of trees here that are gonna be taken away. Arlington has just started a project to try and look at reducing uh, hot spots and heat islands. This is not currently one, but it could become one if trees are taken away. And we've all been hearing about climate stress and climate resiliency needs and global warming. If we lose the 80 to 100 trees that are here currently, or whatever number they are, which is in, is in the tens of trees, we're going the wrong direction. And we should certainly not be rewarding any developer or this one by taking away the tens of thousands of dollars that removing those trees because we don't want them to do it would cost them. So I ask you to seriously consider if, um, if we should uh, or should not allow uh, unfair removal of fees that go against uh, the grain of our town and what we do still have a little control over. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Uh, excuse me, uh, next on my list um, is Wanell Evans. Thank you very much, Wanell Evans, Orchard Place. Um, thank you to the, to the developer and um, your representatives for your, for your presentation. Um, I agree with a lot of what people have previously said. Um, as a neighbor, though, um, I have some fairly specific concerns. As others have pointed out, this is a whopper of a building, uh, especially on a street where nothing is above two and a half stories. So, so my concerns are about how this will kind of integrate into the neighborhood. And I have three specific areas. Um, the first is the one that Ms. Thornton mentioned, which is the requested waiver from, from the dark sky, uh, from the uplighting regulations. I'm guessing that the people who live in this building would also like not to have uplighting. Uh, there is so much evidence about how this affects the natural world, birds, animals. It's, it's really, the more we learn about it, the more damaging that we learn that it is. Uh, so that is one concern going forward. Um, the other is that if you look at this street, I believe there is exactly one street tree which is struggling on the entire block. And everybody who lives around this building, you know, there is subsidized apartments across the street. There is lower cost old apartment buildings, a two family rental on the other side. This is not one of the, the ritzier areas of Arlington. And I think it would be a really, really, uh, a really nice uh, gesture and benefit to this block 
to think about doing something in front of the building rather than putting all of the park area within and behind the building for the exclusive use of the residents. So that would be something I would really appreciate being taken into, um, into consideration. And the, the final thing is, uh, it's my understanding that there will not be a 24 seven uh, on-site manager. And I'm wondering how the building will handle the inevitable overnight guests. Uh, there is no overnight street parking in Arlington allowed. So they will not be able to park on Mass Ave. There is a very conveniently located private way, however, which uh, does allow overnight street parking, but only for the residents of that street and their guests. Uh, so I am wondering how this will be handled. I'm assuming that people who live in this building will find out pretty quickly about the perk of the private way and will be abusing that. So um, those, are, those are the things that are top of my list right now. And thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Thank you, Kurt um, So On my list, um, uh, I had Joanne Preston on the list, um, but she has taken her name down. Um, did you want to make a comment? Yes, I did. Ms. Preston. Um, Paul Wagner mentioned it. Oh, sorry, just uh, name and address of the record. Oh, sorry. Joanne Preston, 42 Mystic Lake Drive. And um, I had a question. May I ask a question of the developer? Uh, through me, absolutely. OK. Uh, does he know of the Massachusetts Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program? Mass Municipal Vulnerability. Um, vulnerability. Uh, Arlington just got a grant from these people. Um, it's oh. MVP is the okay. initial. Um, if you like, I'll just continue. Please do. Okay. Um, it's an initiative to identify and reduce what are known as extreme heat islands. Extreme heat islands are places in towns and cities which have a much higher temperature than the surrounding area. Um, they are most related to large buildings and the absence of mature trees. The developer has proposed um, cutting down the mature Norway maples um, and I just wanted to add that uh, the invasiveness is only that they drop their seeds earlier than other trees. The state does not recommend cutting it down, only that not more of them be planted. But anyway, the developer has said it's developing vegetation for the years to come. Um, I think that they should be in touch with this organization, um, which is strongly supporting maintaining mature trees so that we won't be creating yet another extreme heat island in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Preston. Are there additional members of the public who wish to address the board this evening? I'm just gonna quickly look through all the pictures, see if anyone is waving frantically. I do not see anyone waving. Um, I do not see any other hands raised. Um, Ms. Thornton appears to be asking to be recognized for a second time. Uh, Barbara Thornton, uh, 223 Park Ave. Yes, apparently there are people in the waiting room that can't get in that want to speak. Oh. That have been listening. Oh, dear goodness. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Uh, so 
for those of you who are who are just in the waiting room, I apologize that uh, we didn't get you in quicker. Uh, we are in the public participation section. So if you would like to address the board, um, you can use the raise hand feature in the um, participants tab, or if you're calling in by phone, you can dial star nine. Um, and we will uh, put you on the speakers list and uh, we have the, the public comment period um, is still open. So with that, um, Anson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Anson you Stewart. Name and address for the record, yep. Moulton Road, uh, Tolt Moulton Road, Arlington. I was uh, listening in on the phone, but wanted to uh, join via Zoom so that my comments would not be uh, strangely disembodied. Um, I, <laughs> I appreciate that, thank you. Thanks to Ms. Thornton for uh, flagging the waiting, or the waiting room issue. Um, in general, I'm excited to see the development of this project. I think it's great uh, to have more housing in Arlington and especially housing in a transit accessible and bike accessible location. Um, I did have some questions about the parking waivers. Um, as I understand it, as of last town meeting, the requirement for parking is only one space per unit in multifamily zones. Um, so I just wasn't sure if the applicants are would need to request a waiver if they're uh, getting the multifamily use or if they would even consider lower parking to reduce uh, the space dedicated to storing cars and maybe have a little bit more retail footprint or other uses that would be kind of neighborhood amenities. Um, I'm sure I'll have more questions as, as uh, the additional hearings come up, but thanks for now. Thank you. Okay. And then also, um, uh, Grant Cook. Hi, uh, Grant Cook, uh, 16 Wollaston Ave um, in the Heights. Um, yeah, I think from what I've seen in this presentation, this seems like a good project. I think we talk about local control in this town, but look what we've done with local control. I think four or 5% of our property is dedicated to multifamily um, with the MB, you know, everything requiring a special permit. I mean, this is a, we need more housing. Um, you know, Arlington is focused on being a residential community. We don't have space like Med for other towns dedicated to industry or rail yards or other things. So our density, you know, anybody who's driven around these other towns, residentially, they are more dense than at least the area that I live in, in the Heights. But looking at the affordable, I, I, I sort of cringe listening to people laugh at uh, apartments uh, available for a quarter million dollars, which is unheard, an unheard of price point in Arlington. Um, my house probably, the house next to me sold for probably six times that amount recently. I'm sure there are speakers on this very call whose houses would sell for eight, nine, ten times that amount. A quarter million dollar condo is um, get somebody into Arlington. And, and I'm, I'm actually going to let somebody else speak right here, which is the words of, of Kim Janey, who was um, the former mayor of Boston, who talked about the value of, of, of ownership. She said, I don't think it's enough just to look at the supply of affordable housing, which says to live in this house, you must remain poor. And she's asking her words. What I'm asking us to do is think about the economic pathways out of poverty. I'm asking us to think about how we address inequities or create through legislation that were discriminatory in nature. Most of us are willing to acknowledge this, but what are we going to do to repair the harm. 13 units, I think it actually doubles the number of affordable ownership opportunities we have. That itself is a stark reminder of how little we've done in this area. And I hope, I'm glad to see us allowing a bit more if this project goes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cook. Uh, next is Sanjay Newton. Good evening. Uh, Sanjay Newton, 32 Ottawa Road. Uh, I too am, am pleased to see uh, this project uh, coming to town, and um, I'm I'm a hopeful uh, to to you know watch this process move forward. Uh, I'm particularly I'm I'm happy to see it along Mass Ave in our major transit corridor near the bike path, um, and you know I, I'm I'm looking forward to um, you know watching. The rest of this process play out and, and having some more housing here in Arlington. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Uh, next on the list uh, is James Fleming. Yep. Can you hear me? I can. 
And that's like, my camera isn't working. So I will unfortunately be a disembodied voice. <laughs> um, my, my comment uh, was, sorry, name and address for the record. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, James Fleming, 58 Oxford street. Um, my comment was, I was wondering if the applicant would consider putting the building a little bit closer to the street as it is, it's my, from having lived on apartment buildings on Mass Ave, open space in the front of an apartment building is basically wasted space. It's never used for anything. It's not comfortable to use open space on a major road. And having the building be closer to the street, I think, would look better in the context of the rest of Brattle Square, where you have commercial buildings right on the street. Uh, it makes the street seem a little more continuous. And then you can save space in the back and have that either be fewer trees being cut down or you can have it be more green space or you know, whatever whatever is more useful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fleming. Quick check. There is no one in the waiting room. Um, there is no one who has their hands up. So uh, last call for uh, public comment this evening. Checking the pictures. Don't see anyone else wishing to speak. So with that, um, the public comment period for this hearing, this not, tonight's hearing is now closed. Uh, thank you to all of you who have contributed this evening. Um, as, as everyone sees, there is a, a wide variety of, uh, of opinions and concerns uh, that we have in this community in regards to this proposed development. And uh, I really appreciate everyone from, from all perspectives for coming forward and speaking uh, to the board tonight. Um, so now there's a couple of sort of <clears throat> business and record keeping items we need to take care of um, in regards to this project. Um, and a couple of uh, votes that the board will need to take um, in regards to, uh, to the application. Um, so the first, uh, as we have stated before, so the once the hearing has been opened, the period for review by the board is 180 days. Um, so 180 days from today would be um, is in uh, which is, is the date uh, is April 16th, uh, 2023. Uh, so um, I'm going to make a motion for the board. Um, I will be looking for a second from the board, and then we'll take a roll call vote. Um, so I move that having received the assent of the, uh, so I would just want to confirm with the applicant that today is the first day of the hearing. Is there any objection to that? No. No. Nope. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so I move having received assent from the applicant, the ZBA affirms that the 180 day hearing period for the purposes of 760 CMR 5605 sub three shall be deemed to have commenced on October 18th, 2022. Uh, may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So, uh, vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Was that an aye, Ms. Hoffman? Sorry. Yes, it was an aye. You don't know, show is muted, but you're coming across as muted. I don't know why. Um, Mr. Holly? Uh, and the chair votes aye, so that is passed. That moves to the second of these votes. Um, so I would move that the Zoning Board of Appeal receive all documents, correspondence, and comments received as a part of the initial application, including the reformatted uh, table of waivers. So this is uh, entering the application um, formally into the record. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So vote of the board, uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Can you hear me? I can now. Perfect. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Mr. Holly? Aye. Wonderful. And chair votes aye. Um, the next vote, so the, the uh, applicant has met with um, 
the select board and the conservation commission and possibly other boards in town. Uh, so we would like to incorporate those minutes uh, into the formal record for this uh, for this hearing. So uh, I would move that the ZBA incorporate all minutes from meetings of various town boards and commissions conducted with representatives of the applicant up to the time of the application. And the second. second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Mr. Chairman, I have a question about this, yes, one, sir. if I may. Um, assuming that this, uh, that this motion is approved, uh, what will that mean as a practical matter? Will the, are those particularly the recordings and, and uh, the various things that are referred to be physically put into the record in our proceedings? How will people know that it's there and, and be able to access it? Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Hahn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the most appropriate way to incorporate um, the substance of those meetings are any A, presentations that were made in an open meeting. So, for example, for the select board and the project eligibility, to my recollection, the uh, Maggiore's uh, made a presentation that would be incorporated into the record and can be uh, found that's already been submitted to the select board. So it's easily put on uh, your sort of list of documents and made available on your website if you'd like. Secondly, any meeting minutes would be the primary, would be the primary reflection to the extent that there are recordings still available. Typically in Arlington, recordings are kept for a certain period of time, but um, you could create links, for example, to any ACMI broadcasts of a select board meeting, which are kept for, for a long, long time, and then also the minutes. So practically speaking, you're talking about any presentations, exhibits, documents that were used in those meetings, which all have to be preserved anyway, meaning minutes, and to the extent that they exist, um, you can uh, include a meeting uh, recordings and we can have a transcript of the meeting if the board would like. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Can I ask you one other question, Mr. Heim? Uh, supposing that there are recordings of, uh, of relevant proceedings now, will approval of this and put, putting them in the record in our case uh, result in a stop order so that there's no future destruction? Mr. Chairman, may Please, Mr. Heim wouldn't consider it a stop order as much as a request from the Zoning Board of Appeals to preserve those records to the extent that they haven't already been deleted. As folks may know, Zoom recordings quickly eat up a lot of space for longer meetings. Uh, if they're still around, I think it would be considered a request from the Zoning Board to preserve those so that we can make them A, publicly available, but also B, available to the uh, Zoning Board for the review and you know use in the record to the extent that uh, they have relevant information. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, one last thing. It, it, it may be helpful if, uh, again, assuming that this motion passes, it may be helpful if the applicant would assist us by telling us which meetings we should be looking at and what we're, uh, because they know better than, than we do uh, where they've appeared and under what circumstances. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, I, I just want to point out um, and remind the board of a comment of, uh, of town council. Um, you know, the pre-application informational meetings that the applicant went through with the town uh, was designed to help the applicant with the application that it has pulled together and presented to this board and the particular project that it has presented to this board. Um, I, I would not want there to be any confusion that uh, materials presented previously uh, to the extent they are different than the materials that have been presented to this board, that the only thing the applicant is interested in is the application it has made to this board. Um, now, the project hasn't changed uh, dramatically. Um, I'm not trying to say that you're looking at something different than what was presented to the selectmen or to the CONCOM, you're not. But I'm concerned that we really need to keep uh, the record as clear as we can. Um, the application and project that um, we are looking to obtain a comprehensive approval for is the one that we submitted to this board as it may be amended and revised through the proceedings with this board. Um, with that clarification, if the board wants to see previous schematic designs, which may not be as 
for as as developed as much as the ones that you guys have gotten that's for the board to decide its usefulness i mean i don't i don't matter but yeah uh, so you, Mr. you're, you're adding a lot of you're adding a lot to the record that may not be relevant that's all i wanted to point out no i appreciate that i mean basically what the board is looking for is that you know records of uh this project as has been uh previously discussed with other with other boards and entities um, committees in town we would like that to remain within with the record because there are you know that is relevant to uh some of the discussions that you've been having specifically with with concom and the concerns that they have expressed to you um those kinds of things are, are important for us um as we review the documents um to understand you know so the the perspective of of concom um, and obviously with the select board in regards to the, the their response to the initial request for comments on project eligibility. So we just want to make sure that those records are maintained. Um, and that's the reason for us uh, having this vote tonight to incorporate the, the minutes from those uh, sessions as a part of our record. Yeah. I will point out to the board if you don't uh, are and you're if you're not aware of it is that the Board of Selectmen did submit a comprehensive letter to Mass Housing in response to a request by Mass Housing to comment. That is on our in our record right now. It is? It is, yes. Okay, so you have that Board of Selectmen letter. You see, I guess the, the other concern that I have is that, um, you know, again, I haven't gone through all the minutes. They say what they say you know, whether or not we agree or disagree with how a meeting may have been recorded. I don't want that to be a source of confusion, um, but because I really think that we should um, use this process and these proceedings to vet all of the issues, mm -hmm. even if we have to go over turf that we previously went over with other boards, it's this proceeding that yeah. uh, should be as comprehensive as the board wants it to be. And we really shouldn't rely on what happened previously. But again, I just point that out and and we'll comply with how the board wants to proceed. Thank you. Um, so the motion before the board is to um, incorporate all minutes from meetings of various town boards and commissions conducted with representatives of the applicant up to the time of the application. Uh, and that uh, was made by the chair and seconded by Mr. Hanlon. Um, so vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Um, moving to the next vote. Um, so as a part of the review process, uh, the board will be um, engaging uh, consulting engineers and other consultants to assist with the review of the application. Um, it, specifically in areas where the town uh, does not have expertise on site on staff. Um, and so what the ZBA will be asking for is an initial sum of $10,000 uh, from the applicant to retain the peer review consultants. Um, and we're specifically considering the areas of civil engineering and site design uh, the building design and urban context, uh, environmental impact, and uh, traffic and transportation impacts. And so we would be looking to request the initial sum of money and to authorize town council and the planning department to uh, retain the peer review consultants on behalf of the board. Um, so the motion would be, I move the ZBA requests the applicant, um, the applicant, uh, transfer an, an initial amount of $10,000 to the designated town account to retir, retain peer review consultants in the areas of civil engineering, site design, building design, urban context, environmental impacts, and traffic and transportation impacts. Said funds will also be used for the transcription of all hearings in relation to this application. Further, that town council and the Department of Planning and Community Development staff be authorized to retain appropriate peer review consultants for such purposes and communicate needs for additional funds for the retention of such consultants consistent with chapter 44, section 53G. The board reserves the right to request additional funds in the future 
to review these and other possible topics which might require analysis by an outside expert. Um, can I have a second on that? Second. Any questions from the board? Now we'll proceed to a vote. Uh, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. The chair votes aye. Uh, that brings us to um, uh, so part of the part of the application, as we had stated at the beginning, there's very, there's a lot of different pieces to the application, um, and we just want to make sure that we have everything uh, that we are um, supposed to have under under state statute. Uh, so the, what we've done in the past is the board has requested that the town council's office perform a completeness review on the application and provide a just a, a basic report to the board. Um, in regards to that effect. So uh, I would move that the ZBA request town council to perform a completeness review of the application and provide a report back to the board and the applicant within 30 days of this evening's hearing. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, any questions from the board? Seeing none, vote of the board, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. The chair votes aye. Um, so the next question um, is often the board. So some members of the board have had an opportunity to walk the site uh, when mass housing was available. Um, I think it would be valuable for the board to have an opportunity uh, to see the site um, and to walk it with the applicant just so we fully understand what it is that the applicant is intending to do. Um, so if the applicant would be amenable to that, we would um, we would just ask that um, you provide us with possible dates for an on-site meeting to review the conditions. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, so I will just make a motion to that effect. So I move that the board request the applicant to propose possible dates and times for an on-site meeting to review site conditions with the board, the applicant, and the respective consultants. For a second. Hanlon, any question from the board? Uh, I have second. a question. Yes, Ms. Hoffman? Um, if is would that meeting sort of be subject to the other like the rules? Um, such as like the Mullen rule with, in terms of attendance of the board? Um, so it would be it would be more like a working session. It wouldn't be a formal hearing session. It would still be a public meeting because it would involve a quorum of the board. And so as such, the date of the meeting would have to be publicly advertised. It would have to be open. Um, but as such, uh, it would not fall under the, the meeting requirements in terms of um, attendance. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, would, you, would you be um, looking for particular consultants on our end to join the site visit? Or are you talking about the consultants that the, the town will be engaging? Um, it might be a good opportunity for, for the two to meet. Um, at this point, the, you know, the board is just in the beginning process of hiring consultants. So um, we would wanna make sure that our consultants see the site. I mean, we're assuming that your consultants are very familiar with it anyway. So it would most likely just be, be our consultants unless there's a specific request otherwise. No, that's fine. Um, so uh, then a vote of the board um, to, re to request the on-site meeting. Uh, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. Chair votes aye. That motion is passed. Um, so the next one is sort of a big one. Um, so the board needs to consider whether to assert safe harbor in regards to um, this project. As we had discussed at the, at the start, there are various state harbor provisions under state law, which if the town qualifies, essentially what it does is it allows the board's, it 
removes the option for the board's decision to be reviewed by the <coughs> um, any appeal by the applicant would go uh, straight to the courts. Um, if the town does not meet any of the safe harbor provisions, then any decision that the board renders um, can be appealed to the Housing Appeals Committee. And um, as we said you know, before, the Housing Appeals Committee is specifically designed to, in, to uh, basically streamline um, development of these types of projects. And so typically town appeals against towns are not viewed favorably from the town's perspective. Um, and so the, whether the board can assert that it meets any of the safe harbor provisions is uh, a very important consideration in the review of these projects. Um, the documentation that the board has, uh, so we have requested updated information from the Department of Planning and Community Development um, in regards to uh, these uh, various, um, various options. Uh, the specific one that is most uh, critical is the, the general land area minimum. Uh, so this is one that the board had asserted that it met back in 2016 in regards to the Mugar development. Um, the board had asserted it. It was, the applicant had appealed it. It ended going to the courts. It stayed in the courts for a very long time. Uh, the town did not prevail. And as a, as a sort of a, a coming immediately on the heels of that decision, the state issued revised guidelines as to how one is to calculate um, the guaranteed land area minimum. And um, so the board can, the, in going into that calculation includes all uh, the land area that is dedicated to projects that have affordable housing as a part of them, as long as they have been approved um, to proceed. And so, 1165 R Massachusetts Avenue, which is a was a 40B project that was approved last year, that is under construction. That now counts um, in the town's calculation, but the development uh, at Thorndike Place um, does not count because it is still tied up in the courts. Um, and so, the, I had asked the uh, Department of Planning and Community Development to um, go back and take a look at where the town stands now relative to that calculation. Um, and they issued uh, at my request a memorandum that is included um, on the agenda for tonight's meeting and to sort of get to the bottom line, um, the current estimated Plan for 2022 is 1.44%. Um, so it is still shy of 1.5%. Um, the reason we say it's an estimated number is that some of the housing that is in, would be included in this calculation uh, very specifically deals with uh, residents who have um, sort of sensitive conditions and their the location of their housing is not public and therefore getting a very accurate reading of this number is difficult in some areas. Um, so what we have is we have the most accurate record that we are able to acquire essentially without uh, petitioning the state for um, issuance of additional information. Uh, I would ask attorney Heim if that's a, the correct way of sort of a, sort of stating that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um if I may, I'll answer that question, just go into one or two more details if the chair will Please. allow. Um, so that's correct. The uh, primary er area of knowledge that sort of gets a little bit fuzzy sometimes is group homes. The last time we asserted um, safe harbor status under the general land area minimum, we ended up actually having to sue the state to get access to those records because DHCD themselves does not have access to those records for the purposes of their subsidized housing inventory. Um, in short, we had to end up filing suit against DMH and other uh, uh, entities that feel it's their duty to keep that information as confidential as possible. For reasons that a lot of folks can understand in terms of the types of folks who might be vulnerable and are living in those housing and that housing. And um, as part of our application uh, for the assertion of the one and a half percent, we filed certain documents under seal. I also just want to note that um, the 
litigation of this particular issue uh, went on for about three years. We assumed the most aggressive posture that the town could take. Um, many members of the board are familiar with special counsel John Witten, who was hired specifically to litigate that issue um, and did uh, an excellent job alongside Adam Korowski, who's no longer uh, employed by the town, our GIS coordinator. Um, there are many aspects of the HPC's decision that I vehemently disagree with. Um, one of the things that happened in that particular matter was what I believe was an ex post facto application of those revised GLAM guidelines that you mentioned. In other words, GLAM guidelines were revised in part in response to Arlington's assertion of its one and a half percent. The point that I'm trying to make for the board is we threw the kitchen sink at uh, the, in support of the assertion of our one and a half percent in the last uh, 40B of controversy and uh, the HAC still found against us, including in some ways that um, were very difficult to accept, but nonetheless remain the state of the law. So for example, uh, in Arlington, private ways were considered developable land by the HAC. That is not going to change. This is a legislative problem and a political problem. It is not something that the ZBA or the town's legal department or the planning department can change uh, because we don't think it's right. Um, it's something that the arbiter of this decision has decided in terms of how they're going to interpret their regulations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Heim. Um, give an opportunity also uh, to Kelly Lanham, the Assistant Director of Planning and Community Development. I don't know if you have any further comments on the GLAM calculation. Sure, I think just the one thing to add in listening to your description is just to clarify that um, while we do not know the location or the land area of group homes right now, in this calculation, we used the calculation that was accepted by the HAC in the 2019 decision. So we didn't assume zero, we just assumed that it remained the same. Great, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. If I may, I've got a question that I'd like you to ask for Mr. Heim. One of the reasons, apparently, as I understand what Mr. Heim just told us, um, the regulations that uh, were adopted near the end of that proceeding and that were applied sort of retroactively, uh, possibly in order to deny us the ability to successfully claim the 1.5%, um, those regulations now have been on the books for several years. It isn't ex post facto anymore. Uh, and so, if I understand Mr. Heim correctly, what he's saying is that the current regulations that determine what we can do and how we can do it in making that calculation are regulations that have been adopted uh, in light of our previous position and which were relied on by HAC in denying our previous position and that the, whatever question there may be about the legitimacy of that then, uh, there'd be no question about their applying those same regulations now. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, that is correct and well stated with the exception of one clarification. Um, and that's probably due to miss, uh, something that I misspoke about. They're not regulations, they're guidelines on how to interpret the same regulations. So the regulations have been on the books for quite some time. Uh, the guidelines in terms of how to interpret those regulations, and I don't want to be flippant. Uh, excuse me for perhaps being a little bit uh, sore about the uh, uh, outcome of uh, some previous litigation, but the there are a number of issues that were uh, somewhat ambiguous and that we felt were um, rightly interpreted by Arlington. Those guidelines in terms of how to interpret the regulations we felt were applied retroactively, but that is not the case anymore. Those uh, guidelines in terms of how to interpret the regulations have been on the books now for several years. Thank you. Thank you, John. So that, so just to go down through the list of the uh, the different minima. So the first is the housing unit minimum, which would be the town having greater than 10% of housing units listed on the subsidized housing index. Um, the town is definitely below that number right now. Um, ask Ms. Lenema if she happens to know the presented off the top of her head. Yes, right now the town is at 6.54%. Uh, thank you for that. The second criteria would be the general land area minimum. Uh, having greater than 1.5% of available land area dedicated to units on the subsidized housing index. Um, our best calculation is that we are at 1.44%. Uh, the total land area having greater than 3%, uh, sorry, 
0.3% of all land area and residential, commercial, and industrial areas dedicated to units on the subsidized housing index. Um, I don't think we have calculated that precisely, but uh, at, the pri at the prior hearing, it was determined that we were nowhere near that number. Um, the housing production plan, having met or exceeded 0.5% of the affordable housing production goal within the calendar year would grant us a one-year uh, moratorium and exceeding 1% would give us a two-year moratorium. Uh, the town was granted a one-year moratorium last August after the approval um, and of the uh, project for 1165 R Mass Ave. Uh, that one-year moratorium has expired as of August. Um, recent progress towards housing unit minimum, having created subsidized housing units equal to at least 2% of the municipality's total number of housing units within the last year, uh, the town has, has not done so. Um, review of large projects, the number of units in the proposed projects exceeds 2% of all housing units in the municipality. It does not, um, that number is somewhere over 400. Um, and this is obviously well short of that number. Um, and related applications, prior applications for construction on the same land within the previous 12 months. That would be specifically if there were applications for special permits or variances. And it's intentionally to prevent somebody uh, seeking a variance on a property and then immediately turning around and requesting a 40B. And uh, that has not happened. These sites have not been subject to any action before the Zoning Board of Appeals or the Redevelopment Board um, in recent memory. So with that in mind, um, I feel very confident that the town does not meet any of the statutory minima, uh, which would allow the town to assert safe harbor in regards to um, a 40B application at this time. Um, the board does have 15 days to make this decision. This is not a decision that we need to make this evening. Um, but if I don't know if any, if there would be any change in any of the information the board would have um, within the next 14 days. Uh, the board does have a meeting next week if members of the board would be more comfortable postponing a vote on this question um, until that time. Otherwise, um, I think it's appropriate for the board to go ahead and, and vote at this time based on the decision that it, it has, based on the, excuse me, on the information that it has. So I will move that upon review of the subsidized housing inventory, related town records, and the Department of Planning and Community Development memorandum regarding the status of the general land area minimum, the board confirms that the board will not assert safe harbor protection under 760 CMR 5603. Second. Seconded by Mr. Hanlon. Are there any questions uh, from the board in regards to this vote and the implications of the vote? Seeing none, um, let's do a roll call vote of the board. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That brings us to the final vote we need to take this evening, which would be uh, to continue um, this hearing. Uh, we had a coordination meeting with the applicant uh, at the beginning of the month, at sort of setting out a schedule for, um, for this hearing and for uh, some of the subsequent hearings, the hiring of consultants and such. So uh, just to confirm with the applicant that the date we agreed to continue to was going to be Tuesday, November 22nd. Is that the date that you all have in your records as well? Uh, it is. Perfect. So with that, I would move that tonight's hearing be continued until Tuesday, November 22nd, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Thanks, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, Mr. Chair. If I Mr. may, Feldman. before we conclude, um, in order to keep the process productive and moving and efficient, um, maybe it makes some sense to talk about um, trying to focus the attention of the subject matter for November 22nd so that we can uh, get lined up any uh, peer review that you would like on the subject matter 
And rather than have to try to get all of the peer reviews in simultaneously, we're not going to most most likely not going to cover all of the subjects in the same evening, but at least we could start addressing uh, some of them. And you know, again, I leave it up to the board. I don't we don't particularly mm -hmm. care what order, um, but the one that um, may make sense uh, to proceed on because it's 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 relatively compact and manageable to be able to be done between now October 18th and November 22nd would be traffic, where we pre we present on November 22nd the traffic assessment impact report that's part of our application by Vaness um, Associates that prepared it. Um, if you could identify and bring online um, your review consultant in the next few days, it's not a it's a uh, it's not an overwhelming traffic study that I think will be challenging for a review consultant to be able to review and provide uh, comment back. Hopefully, even a couple of a few days before November twenty second, so we have an opportunity to see the review comments, so we can even be prepared to address them substantively if we can on the 22nd. Um, and if you don't want to do traffic, we could pick another subject. I'm not trying to suggest how you guys <laughs> do this. I'm just trying to keep us moving efficient, efficiently so that we're just not here on the 22nd saying, well, we don't have any of our peer reviews. Let's continue it another month because it is important to the applicant that not only do we get through this process within six months, but hopefully well before six months. Um, yeah. It's a very expensive process. Um, under our contracts, um, we have permitting um, deadlines and uh, we really need to, we, we, we really don't want to find ourselves needing to extend the process after 180 days. We'd really mm -hmm. like to try to accomplish it and complete it and get a yay or an A before well before 180 days absolutely no and i think your recommendation to to do traffic first um is a good one because as you say it is uh, a relatively straightforward question um and it's one that's fairly you know fairly uh easy to get into um quickly at the town we are working with uh with the department of planning and community development and the town council's office to um bring peer, peer review consultants online. So we'll have them um, available as soon as we can. And I think uh, we can just dis discuss, um, we should hold a another um, sort of planning session uh, just to sort of work through the, the rest of the schedule um, at some point, probably in about two weeks, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, that, that would be fine. Um... Uh, again, um, you know, identifying your other review consultants and getting them online um, so that we can get regular feedback. It may very well be that at a, at a subsequent meeting, we could tackle two subject matters. We don't Absolutely. have to have a separate meeting for each subject matter. I'm just thinking that to be able to get review consultants on board, have them have an opportunity to review the project, provide comments mm -hmm. um, so that we can respond substantively to do that for too many subjects the first time we're just not yeah. going to accomplish anything absolutely mr chairman mr hanlon um i'd like to one of the things we'll do whether we do traffic or anything else on that first me meeting is begin to plot out what subjects will be coming up in future meetings and i just wanted to note that while this relates to our peer review consultants uh it also relates to other boards and commissions in the town who have been given notice on this and who will soon, I hope, be uh, providing us with their perspective of, as to what they think the issues are and the way in which they would formulate their approach to them. Those are all things that we will be, need to take account in planning out uh, what the schedule is and what the order of, of the, uh, uh, what the order of the meetings are. Also, we've gotten a number of comments tonight as to issues to from the from residents and uh, as to issues that we should be focusing on. Uh, and I would encourage people who uh, have thoughts about that, uh, who may not have told us what their thoughts are already to do it, because once we figure out sort of where we think the issues are and we begin working through them, 
there's a certain degree of learning that we do and which ultimately results in some degree of imp improvising. But the major issues need to get sort of understood fairly early if we're going to proceed in an efficient uh, in an efficient way. And, and so those things are out as well as the attitudes or the advice that we receive by, uh, from peer review consultants. Thank you, Jim. The, the motion that, um, is there any further uh, discussion in regards to um, this application this evening? Mr. Chairman, just, uh, just one more comment. Um, yes, when, when we have the opportunity to uh, address some of the comments we heard today, we heard some, you know, very, very good feedback. Um, and we'd like to, you know, we, community outreach and, and hearing what the, the public has to say is, is important to projects like this. And, um, you know, and we, we appreciate it and value that feedback. And we'd like to respond individually if we can uh, to a degree. And maybe that can happen during that next meeting also. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah, to follow up, Matt, with what you just said, some of the, uh, I'm in a complete agreement, it may make sense that some of the specific comments, you know, there were some comments regarding, for example, uplighting, that would be appropriate when we're discussing the design of the building, and, and you know, we'll address those comments of uplighting in that context, so we could do it independently. We're going to get new public comments at every hearing, so we'll make sure we cover them all. Um, and we'll leave it up to the chair to tell us, do you want us to respond, uh, you know, in the moment, or do you want to defer response until we're at the subject matter of the comment? Okay. Uh, with that, then I will take a vote um, of the board to continue the, uh, the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Bellbrook until Tuesday, November 22nd, 2022 at 7.30 p.m. Uh, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Gardelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. The chair votes aye. We are continued on uh, the comprehensive permit hearing, which, uh, so we th thank the applicant uh, for all their participation this evening. I uh, look forward to uh, seeing you back before us um, next month. And uh, for the rest of the board, I'm sorry I have to keep you for some other, for some other business. Thank you so much for your time this evening to everybody. We appreciate it very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one Mr. quick Mr. question. Uh, Paul Maggiore, um, where, uh, where do we deliver the check? <laughs> that will... Um, your house, sir? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we just need to make sure the account is set up before you send it over. Okay. You'll let us know. We will absolutely will. Yes. Thank you kindly for your time. All of you appreciate it. You're very welcome. Okay. Have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Uh, so I will return back to our agenda and go back to the administrative items. Um, so that would be the next item on our agenda would be a uh, vote on the approval of a written decision. This is for 7072 Oxford Street. This was written by Mr. Hanlon and reviewed, distributed and reviewed by the board. And um, a final version was issued um, earlier today. Um, are there any questions in regards to the written decision for 7072 Oxford Street? Jim. Seeing none, uh, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. And may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Riccadelli. So a vote of the members who were uh, voting on the initial uh, would be Venkat Holly. Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, Mr. DuPont being absent tonight. So that written decision is approved. And that can be... Um, Turn to the applicant. Uh, and then the last uh, piece of business for this evening is a discussion of hybrid meeting discussion points. So at next week's meeting, uh, the hybrid meeting review committee um, is coming to speak with us um, in regards to how the board might proceed with hybrid meetings uh, going forward. And 
as a part of that, they issued a document, which I believe I shared with everyone, um, which had a few discussion points that they had wanted us to have before the meeting, just so that we didn't meet with them sort of flat footed on this question. Um, and so I will go ahead and share this screen. Um, so this is oops, the, the decision points they had asked us to address. So um, wonder if we should delegate a sufficiently trained person or other meeting member or staff person to manage the remote communications. Um, ideally, that would be the board um, assistant once that position is filled. Um, but in the meantime, I was would ask um, uh, Mr. Valarelli or Mr. Lee, if either of them would feel comfortable serving in that role. We can handle that, Mr. Chairman. What's that? We can handle that. That'll be fine. Excellent. Um, the second is what happens in the case of a technical failure? So if in the middle of the meeting, the meeting suddenly gets cut off, what is sort of the default position? Um, so we, the things that they sort of recommend, one would be that the board just adjourns, that if the meeting dies, that the meeting is adjourned and we pick up at a future date. Um, another would be to pause to allow travel time for people to go to town hall to continue the meeting. So that might be a pause of like half an hour uh, to allow people to gather up their things and come over to town hall and get settled. Um, or continuing with the, we could continue with the meeting, assuming that there's enough people available um, in person to continue with the meeting. And so I'm sort of curious what people think about these different options um, for how one would proceed. My sense is that the pausing is not as helpful um because especially if the, you know we lose the connection because it's a storm we're not going to ask everyone to pack into their cars and drive into the storm to come to town hall to try to continue the meeting um the adjournment um would be a possibility i think continuing is my only concern about continuing is, is, is do we still have a quorum to vote? Because a lot of the things we need to vote on, we need to have a vote of four or five members. So if we have four members present locally and one, part, one participating remotely, if they lose the connection, now the applicant has to have all four votes. And that sort of changes the calculus for the applicant, which isn't necessarily a, a nice thing to do two thirds of the way through, the, through a hearing. Um, so my, my sense would be that we would either postpone, we would either post uh, sort of pause for, you know, say 15 minutes to see if the connection comes back, after which we would automatically adjourn, or if, or we would just, you know, adjourn at that time and then pick up later. Um, I guess I, yes, Leah. Um, I have a question. Adjourning to a predetermined time uh, seems to me to have a lot of advantages to it, as long as we're in a situation where we're not on the verge of allowing uh, time, uh, mandatory time limits mm -hmm. expire. Uh, obviously, we have to think through what, what the implications of this all are as far as notice and the public meeting law is concerned. Um, but Clearly, if we, we would know we're going into any meeting, whether or not we're facing a difficulty, or at least we should know that. Uh, with a 40B, obviously, this kind of thing can come up more than it does normally. But, you know, there's always just the possibility where you have to act more quickly. Um, continuing, so, so you would want to take into consideration that difference. The applicant may be willing to waive in order to avoid having to continue and to have that effect. It would be interesting to think through how it is that that, that waiver could be effectuated. 
so that we could, I mean, we could record it the next time, but the, the applicant would have to be in a position where he could actually do the, the waiver. Uh, it seems to me that, that while pausing doesn't work at all, the uh, continuing with the meeting has the danger of sort of distorting a meeting that's already underway. And it may be a useful thing to do, uh, and it may be the only thing that you can do. Um, but especially since it could be to adverse to the interests of the applicant, it may very well be that if we had a procedure that allowed the applicant to consent to waiving a deadline uh, and that that could be made effective in Mr. Lim's point of view, uh, that we could sort of do an adjournment to a pretty de determined date and time with the applicant at some re relevant point, having uh, either consented to that or saying, well, if we don't consent, then you can go with four, however that concerns out to be. This doesn't need to get, I think, completely decided tonight, but it's a more complicated thing than just picking the alternative because as the question suggests in the, in the bottom part of the paragraph, the right answer may depend upon what, what kind of case you have and what the particular circumstances are. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Other thoughts on this topic? Mr. Chair. Mr. Rigadelli. I, I agree. I agree with what you um, both have brought up, but I think uh, adjourning, if we had to pick one of these options in a, a more black and white sense, I would say adjourning uh, makes the most sense if we could figure out how we would uh, schedule that predetermined time, uh, especially uh, with this continuing option, thinking about um, a situation where we may have uh, enough number of the, uh, members of the board in person uh, that we could continue the meeting, but the public uh, would not have access to the, the hearings uh, because the, the digital piece is gone. Uh, I don't think that that would be a very inclusive way to kind of run the board, so. Thank you. Very good point. Mr. Chair. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, I, I also agree. I think I'm in line with everyone, except my one thing with adjourning is, I th and I think you mentioned this, uh, it seems like it would be appropriate in terms of a technical failure to do a very brief pause before determining to adjourn. So I don't know um, what other committees are doing you know, just, you know, five, 10 minutes, whatever we deem appropriate, so that um, if it turns out to be a very short term failure, we haven't, you know, created more complication than necessary. Uh, that's a very, a very good, good point. Yeah, because sometimes these interruptions seem to be pretty brief. Okay. The next one they asked us to consider, how do you recognize members of public who would like to speak? Uh, boy, it's been so long since we met in person. I'm trying to remember what we did. Uh, <laughs> um, I think we had people raise hands and then we sort of called on them and they may have, I think we just had them sort of stand up in place. I don't think we had them come to a microphone. Uh, we did in the end, we were starting to get online. And so when we were doing things with ACMI, gosh, in their lion's room, I'm trying to remember if we actually had a public mic set up for that purpose or if they just sort of spoke loudly from where they were. Chairman? Yes. I, we, it was a little bit of both sometimes when we had larger hearings uh, and a big crowd, people did come up to a, a microphone especially if, it, if the proceedings were being taped. Well, not taped, that's not what you do anymore, but videoed. Mm -hmm. um, but there also were sort of less formal ones that where people just, you know, mm -hmm. kind of stood up. I mean, we were, we were probably less formal than we should when we would like to be right now uh, to do that. But one of the disadvantages of that procedure when we did it was it was, ex it was I never really went back and listened to the audio tape that we made of those things but it must have been totally unintelligible um, yeah. because nobody was anywhere near a microphone. You know, people were muttering as they leaned over full-size drawings and so forth. So going back to that is not really 
is not really an option. We have to, I mean, basically we have to deal with the fact that that even if Zoom doesn't, isn't doing this, somehow TV is doing it, where all of this is being videoed and it all has, to, everybody who speaks is gonna to have to speak in relationship to a microphone and a camera so that, so that the video can record it. That definitely makes sense. Other thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we had, I was trying to remember if I watched any of those, the, those very few hearings we had before, between when we started <clears throat> with ACMI and we went online. Um, but I, I think it was an issue going back and trying to understand those recordings. And certainly when we were just recording things with a, you know, a pocket recorder on top of the desk, it was very hard sometimes to, to hear people who were not very far away. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moore. Um, yeah, could I make a comment relative to your discussion? I think so. Um, the reason being that uh, the, the tree committee is one of the committees which has agreed to be on the pilot for the, um, uh, the hybrid approach. Mm -hmm. And the, the pilot, we, we just have been talking about this recently. So I know what the town, a little bit about what the town's been doing. They've set up um, one room to start testing this process at the uh, town hall annex. And they also have the TV that, you know, sits in the, the Lions committee room. And the equipment they're installing does the hybrid work and also has uh, cameras that follow the sound and things like that. So it goes and focuses on the people who are talking. It's going to be probably pretty user-friendly pretty quickly to support what you're trying to do. Hmm. So you just might, might want to keep that in mind, that's all. Thank you for that. Um, the next was, what's the expectation for committee members to require a quorum to be attending in person? If you do require a quorum of members in person, do you have rules around how many in-person meetings? So this really sort of gets at you know, how often people have to be in person, um, how comfortable people are being in person, and how we, how we work that. Certainly, you know, going back to the earlier question about you know, what do we do if there's a technical failure? Um, I think we would, you know, if, if the plan was that we would just continue on, then you know, this would be a much more important question. Um, certainly the, the sense I, I was getting from the board was that we would want to um, have, have an adjournment possibly after a pause um, to see if we could get to reestablish things. Um, and then if we did adjourn, it would probably be helpful to have a quorum present who could vote it would be you know three people, so that they could formally vote to a, to continue the hearing, um, and then as far as whether we would have a how, how do people think do we need to have a policy would we want to have a policy about how often people have to appear in person I don't want to force anyone to have to appear in person if they're you know uncomfortable doing so. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon. Um, I could say that I probably will be less comfortable than most of you uh, in in doing that. Um, and I sort of I mean, I have kind of a negative reaction to the idea of having a minimum number of people uh, present in, per in person. Sometimes I would just as soon not have a hybrid meeting at all, actually, uh, and that would vary. But uh, but uh, uh, as soon as you begin doing that. Your essential meeting turns out to be your in-person meeting and everybody else is out on the wings. And there's a certain kind of a distance that I think is not entirely productive of a useful discussion. Um, so I, I guess my sense is that I would be very, not suspicious, I, I would be hard pressed to, to agree with the notion that we ought to have any particular number of people who are in present in person. Thank you. I mean, this is all comes from being a septuagenarian and, and the risks of being in person, particularly if there's going to be a lot of people in a crowded room yeah. uh, are more important to me than they might be to some others. 
Um, yeah, I believe, Mr. Bagnell, you are on the committee. Is that correct? That is that is correct. Uh, can I just comment that the the question of four kind of assumes that as of I think it is March, uh, the executive order allowing for remote participation expires, and committee members would be required to be in person again. An attorney high may be able to offer more uh, insight into that, but our assumption is that the hybrid for committee members might have a clock on it. Mr. Chairman? The legislature might fix that. Uh, Mr. Heim? Yeah, unfortunately, the legislature has, uh, Sir Bagnell probably knows well, and actually Mr. Chair knows well as well, uh, the legislature tends to move uh, at the legislature's own pace. So as every time we think that the order is about to expire at the, not necessarily at the 11th hour, but <laughs> they oftentimes cut it pretty close. So unfortunately, one of the things that we'll have to do is do some contingency planning. Um, there is, to my understanding, some state legislation pending to make some of these um, options permanent, but I'm not sure the status of those as, as of this meeting. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. I think I may have cut off one of our board members on this. Oh yeah, I was just going to weigh in that I'm actually in sort of a similar, despite not being a septuagenarian, I'm in a sort of similar position um, to Mr. Hanlon that I would prefer at least in the short term um, to not be compelled to show up in person on a certain interval. Um, and then, you know, obviously that could be, would be reevaluated in March. <laughs> um, Understandable. Um, number five, Zoom specific decision points. Um, do we need webinar function? So we typically do not use the webinar function in Zoom. Um, I was a little nervous tonight because it, you know anybody could have unmuted themselves at any point, but everyone was really very civil um, in terms of keeping themselves muted. So I don't think webinar is a function that the board specifically needs. Um, we typically do not enable chat. Um, we had a bad experience with chat on the MuGuard development and decided to not turn it back on. Um, I did have a conversation with uh, with Jennifer Seuss about this, um, that some boards like chat because it, it's sort of a, a way for people to put questions in, um, which I think is it sort of depends on how you run the chat. If the chat is just directing questions to somebody who's monitoring the chat on behalf of the board, I think that that, you know, becomes a, a good way to deal with that. If it's just sort of an open forum for people to uh, comment back and forth, then that becomes less helpful very quickly. Um, uh, do we use the waiting room feature? We do. Um, so we would have to So maybe the, given tonight's meeting, maybe the chime announce feature would not be a bad thing to, to use to sort of provide an additional cue that there's somebody in the waiting room that we may wanna uh, let in. Uh, do we record the meeting for the purpose of creating minutes? Uh, we do so, but also ACMI is doing it. Um, will attendees be muted upon entry? That's probably not a bad idea. Um, I can't recall what our current setting is on that question. And that's what they wanted us to discuss. Um, I, I'd ask uh, Mr. Bagnall, is there any other topics we should consider before we speak with you guys next week? No, I, I think that's good. And that's covering it. And it's just things, things to think about. And the rules don't have to be the same for each meeting, right? I think yep. one of our thoughts was this might be, you know, these might be laid out with the agenda that you publish in advance of the meeting so that people going into any given meeting know what the rules of the road are. Perfect. Great, well that sort of includes that. I'll go ahead and stop the share. Um, so that is the end of the business we have before.
before, excuse me, before us tonight. Are there anything else for the board? Um, we are meeting next week. Um, Rick, I can't remember. Do we have one or two things on for next week? I know we have a continuance. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have a continuance and two other hearings, minor in nature, I think projections into minimum yards and um, a usable space deficiency. Uh, okay. That's all we have. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Great. Anything and, and some administrative items, uh, approval of uh, meeting minutes from the last hearing we had that we did not get to tonight. Yeah. And then for tonight's meeting, um, I think now that we have some approval for funds, um, I think we can reach back out to ACORN about giving us a, a full transcript of the meeting as opposed to um, she will, we'll be doing for normal meetings. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. She will have a copy of the, um, of the hearing tonight by tomorrow morning. Wonderful. Yep. Anything further for the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, just in, in light of having another of the usable open space uh, things, uh, wouldn't in the opinion that we approved tonight, we made it clear that that it's the that the question of whether or not uh, there's a significant extension of non-conforming use is in the first instance a uh, decision that needs to be made by ISD, and uh, if if the building inspector is willing to do that at this point. Having been clear about that, it would be better, I think, in terms of procedure to have an explicit decision on the part of the building inspector rather than just assuming implicitly it wouldn't be before us unless there, unless there had been a decision of that kind. So it would, it would be nice, at least, as that if the record would show what the decision of the building inspector uh, was on that point. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I help uh, you with that answer? Absolutely. Uh, great question, Mr. Hanlon. So this particular case is a case that um, actually does have open space, but not enough. Uh, qualifies for a certain amount of uh, GFA of the existing structure, but it does not uh, qualify for the addition that they want to put on. So unlike other cases that we've heard that did not have any open space to begin with to cover what they had, this in fact does have open space to cover X amount of GFA, but not enough. So the uh, commissioner has uh, determined that in that case, uh, the board will hear it. Um, if it goes back to what we were used to, that uh, there was no open space at all, um, we will uh, we'll, we'll, we'll address that and revisit that. And that may not come before the board again. That's still pending. Uh, this case will be heard before the board, uh, according to uh, the building commissioner and myself's uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Unless there's anything further. Oh, I had a quick scheduling question, actually. Yes, please. Um, uh, this is just with regards to the site visit. Yeah. Uh, if we're trying to wait until we have the other sort of expert consultants on board, mm -hmm. is it realistic that that meeting or that uh, visit would occur prior to the next 40B hearing? Or do you think that's it would probably be after? And you're not sure is an okay answer too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that it would occur before then. Okay. Um, certainly the, the intention in, move, in having the hearing on, the, on November 22nd was to provide enough, to, what the applicant would really like and you know, it makes sense is for there to be enough time for the board to hire somebody, have them do a first round of review on what the application is, give it back to the applicant so the applicant can arrive on the at the meeting on the twenty second, sort of prepared to address those questions. Um, so, our hope is that we would have somebody on board, certainly within the next two weeks, um, and then we could have. And it would be great for them, really, at the start to to get a view of the site and to have a sense as to what they're what they're really looking at. So, I'm, you know, fingers crossed. It's within the next two three weeks. Okay, great. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could I ask a question? Mr. Moore. Uh, yeah, in terms of that site visit, is this mm -hmm. for board members only? Are other people, well, like myself, allowed to join you or not? And I understand 
either way would make sense. Yeah. So my so technically, because we we would have a quorum of the board present, it is a public meeting, oh. and as such, it is open to the public. There there was a there were a couple of meetings that were held. Um, well, we had, we had one meeting where the somebody somehow something got messed up and the applicant didn't show up, but we did have a site meeting with the applicant and mass housing and members of the board were invited um, to visit the site. This is probably three months ago now. Um, and so we just, the, it was announced to, on, on the town website that this meeting was happening and the meeting happened. Um, so it's, you know, it is a public meeting people can attend, but you know, the board is not going to, um, you know, do a big announcement, a big splash announcement that this is happening, but we it will be so, noticed um, officially as any other meeting would be noticed. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially would like to thank Rick Fallarelli, Vincent Lee, uh, Kelly Linema, um, Russell Lau, uh, Doug Heim and everyone else at the town uh, for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting uh, this online meeting and this first uh, hearing in regards to uh, this new 40B application. Please note that the purpose of the board's recording the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It is our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to ZBA at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Vote of the board to adjourn, Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Riccadelli. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Chair of uh, the board is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you, guys. Nice Thank job. You. Good night, everybody. Okay. Thank you. See you next week. Take care, everyone. Be Thank safe. you, folks.